Hi everybody, I'm Giller, but my uh, my now name is Michael Anderson, uh, and my mum registered me on the Australian Births, Deaths and Marriages Registry when I was born as Michael Eckford, which was her maiden name. So it confuses a lot of people. So that's part of my life because I have to live in this uh, three-dimensional world. One a black fellow, one of a half-caste, and, and uh, one that belongs to a a white system um, according to the registered books. So yeah, that's uh, um, that's my dilemma uh, that I, I confront all the time. Um, but on the other side of the coin, um, there is another story and, the, and that story is where I come from. I am a Yualiai man, my mother's Yualiai, my father's Gomeroy. Um, my Yualiai country goes across New South Wales, Queensland, the southern central Queensland area. And um, yeah, we come from a, a Yualiai nation, <clears throat> like most um, Aboriginal people. Uh, my family have been had to deal with uh, separation. Uh, my nan was taken when she was 12 year old from the mission school without her parents being told. And uh, six of her siblings, they did the same thing at a place called Angledool in um, northern New South Wales. And she was placed out under four year um, um, what do they call it, um, uh, detention and, um, and under what they call debenture, um, that's, um, that's that uh, apprenticeship they called it. Um, and of course, um, my, uh, her father um, was in fact one of the ceremonial leaders. They were still doing ceremonies back in 1914 and throughout our country to 1936. Um, and um, one of the one of the uh, stories, or the main story I have was from an old auntie, um, was that um, that old man, um, having come from ceremony with all the all his uh, regalia, and walked into the mission uh, at Angledool without any clothes on and painted uh, covered in red ochre, and. Um, demanded that his wife go back to their tribal land. He wanted to walk back. He only had two more siblings left that um, they hadn't taken out of nine. And uh, so he didn't want those two to be taken. And so they, um, uh, the old uh, granny decided, no, I'm, I will wait for my children to come back here. And he kept saying her, they will never come home. These white people will never let them home. And uh, he, in frustration, he struck out at her and he knocked her down and um, uh, she bled from the nose and ears and he thought he'd killed her. And so under our law and custom, when you do something like that, um, and that's the true word of makarata in the Yorungo language, it means that you have to go and spill blood for that wrongdoing so that you can fix it up. And unfortunately, he went and cut his own throat um, on the shearing shed floor of a shearing shed about a kilometre away from where he was. And uh, his youngest daughter, or middle, second youngest daughter, found him and ripped off her dress and uh, wrapped that around his throat to try and save his life. And that was just three of frustration. So we have, we have, we the family talk about this um, as you know as irregular as possible. But the younger ones want to know about it. Um, but <clears throat> the beauty was that the all the siblings who were taken found their way home to their mother. And, um, and of course lived very strong lives and became very protective of their children to the point where they would stand with knives and axes at doors when they saw white people come into their houses. Um, and you'd never take a child from our family ever again. Um, so there's, there's, there is that, you know, and I, I acknowledge your talk about uh, this intergenerational trauma. Um, and yes, it's a, it's a dreadful, uh, world that we live in because we're, you know we're not being we're not confronting it uh, sufficiently enough and we're not attacking it aggressively enough to uh, to fix up the woes and our children and our youth need to see um, older folk like me and others who have learnt how that system crueled us um, our, we need to show leadership to claw back uh, respect in of our culture and of our identities. And um, unless we do that, our young ones are going to constantly be lost in this m melee of um, you know, abuse that we, that we uh, find ourselves in. The, I, I don't want to talk about um, 
politics as it stands right now. What I want to focus on, um, having said, told you that story, um, I do want to just say this, that um, in my studies, I, I studied law and uh, practiced law, um, and I also um, studied a little bit of psychology at university so that I could understand the, the human mind. Um, and, but one thing that I, I have found as a result of you know, maintaining my interest in this area of, um, of um, you know, intergenerational trauma, um, I do have a PhD sitting at home somewhere uh, that I never ever put in um, on intergenerational trauma and I went around the world looking at other First Nations experiences. Um, and we have the same situation that we have now in Australia, high uh, incarceration rates, high suicide rates, high drug and alcohol abuse, and high um, domestic violence abuse. And all of this comes directly from um, that trauma that we are still dealing with internally. <coughs> but the, there is a word I, I, I was uh, following up on some work that was being done where, the mining, where mining was taking place and uh, looking at the psychological impacts it had on our people, young and old. And one of the things that I found was a word called solastalgia. And solastalgia, um, this, this arose as a result of some research that was being done on, in the Hunter Valley by non-Aboriginal people who were looking and speaking with old farmers who, who still lived there. And these old farmers were becoming very, very um, lost in their mind because they were watching <clears throat> those who didn't sell their farms were watching these coal mines develop around them and not only that they were watching hills being torn apart and torn down they were watching big holes in the ground they were watching these mountains of of um, over um, overburden from the mines being stacked up and um, one of the one of the most interesting things was that um, these people, we're starting to get sick um, emotionally, mentally, and um, uh, spiritually, and 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 physically, and so uh, they they became ill because they watched the landscape that they grew up with change before their eyes, and it, this country that they grew up with and were born into and took over their old grandparents' farms no longer looked like what it was when they were children and growing up. So their memories were being disturbed and, um, and they, they were finding it exceedingly difficult to cope with what they were watching, this whole change of the environment around them. So having um, read that uh, report and study, I, I sort of then, I could align all of that with our own experiences. And that was that, um, you know, the landscape, even now, we're watching in southwest Queensland and northwest New South Wales, you know, these new laws around um, um, wild dog trapping and setting up wild dog fencing. They call them cluster fencing in southern Queensland and northern New South Wales. Um, they're about to put up a, you know, 475 kilometre dog fence, which is eight foot high and electrically wired at the bottom uh, to stop animals coming across the border now. And, and wild dogs, they're targeting wild dogs. You know, these are wild dogs that um, go wild when all them whitefellas go out pig hunting and pig shooting and, um, and then they lose their dogs even though they have trackers on them because the batteries wear out on, the, on, the, on those uh, collars. And so they, and they, they form packs and they're, they're roaming this area, so they say. But you see, our problem now is that, you know, when we drive, I listen to Aboriginal people along the way all over and, they, they, and they're basically crying and they see, because they see emus trapped in these fences, they see kangaroos trapped in these fences, they can't move from one area to another. And white people are killing them because they turn all the water off in these paddocks where they got them locked in. And these animals, there's massive killing that's going on within these areas. Now these things are our totems, they're our ancestry beliefs. We have connection to them through um, family, through spirit, through um, our own um, origins in terms of um, um, setting ourselves into our clan system and, our, and, and so we're watching all of this going on and this is having enormous impact on our people especially people you know in their 50s 60s and 70s and 80s watching this this change is taking place right across the country land being cleared 
water and rivers drying up because they've dammed them and they're selling water to irrigators across the country. And we're watching our fish die. We're watching, you know, there's, there's just so much that's going on in the natural world. And that is having significant impact on our people. And so you've got a lot of young people who are saying to me, you know, what hope is there for us? Uncle? You know, how do we deal with this? What do, what do we do? Where do we fit anymore? Do we have a country anymore? And that country no longer looks like what, what, it, what it's supposed to be. You know, I, and, um, and even, you know, my children in their 30s and mid-30s, um, you know, they take their kids out and they're saying, you know, the river's not what it used to be when Dad used to take us out here and teach us how to catch fish and teach us all about the stories along the river. And our, our cultural icons are being cut down because you've got all the old scarred trees along the riverbanks. They're being cut down because these white people are irrigating in these areas and they're taking the trees and plants and native shrubs right out of the riparian areas all around. So the country... <clears throat> so it's just not us now being removed from um, our lands, but those who still live on the lands and who come home on a regular basis just watching a totally, looking at a totally different landscape uh, to that which they knew. And this is having an enormous psychological impact on our people. And this translates then to medical health, medical illness, because, you know, you, you become sick. It, it, it makes you sick. And, um, you know, and when you see this, this, this thuggery and this destructiveness that's going on out uh, in the bush, yeah, our people are just, just lost. And, you know, you throw your arms up and then you say, well, they took our identity, they took our language, they took our dance, they took our ceremony, and now they're reforming, terraforming our country. And, uh, and terraforming is that they're just ripping out everything that we know and growing wheat, growing um, cotton, growing all these other things, barley. And it's purely for the purpose of money-making. Ours is about our country, um, our connection, and making sure that our native animals and everything are still there, our birds. And, um, and we're starting to see now with this mice plague, you know, that's going down around in New South Wales, you know, we're, we're not just watching um, um, things change, the landscape change, but we're starting to see now goannas, we're starting to see um, emus, we're starting to see birds die because all these mice have eaten all this poison that are being laid out all over the country and we're watching our birds die, we're watching our eagles die, we're watching goannas die, we're watching emus die because emus do eat meat, they eat those little things. And, um, and so it's, it's, we have a shocking situation and um, yeah, I'm painting a dreadful picture, um, but that's the reality and that's the reality that we are confronted with as a people. Um, and so where do we look now? How do we change that? Well, the thing is that we have to change it by becoming more assertive. And our, we have to show leadership, by, and there's not enough leadership there. It's not enough to just simply say we need money for drug rehabilitation programs, uh, counselling and all that. It's, that's, it's, we don't need that right now. We need to change the lives and the position of our people so that we get some back, uh, claw back some of that which we own and that we should own. We need to take the, an, an enormous fight to the government because there is too much happening. Um, assimilation was one thing, um, but this terraforming our land and destroying everything and for the purpose of making money, whether it be mining or through massive farming technologies and, and growing cotton, etc., and rice, um, this, this is just not good enough. And, um, yeah, our country um, is, not going, is not what it is, and it's having significant impact on our people's mental and spiritual and emotional well-being. And um, when you have young people saying, you know, there's nothing for us anymore, yeah, um, and then all of a sudden you find them hanging in a room, um, in a house, just as we buried my, uh, they buried my nephew's stepson the other day, 14-year-old, hung himself, um, and we have had several other family members hang themselves. So, and then we have the young ones now turning to ice, turning to speed, turning to different drugs, 
Um, and as my cousin said one time when we buried my father about 25 years ago, um, yeah, they, um, she said to me, come on, cuz, we go and get drunk. And I said, I don't drink like that, sister girl. Why do you want to get drunk? And she said, I don't like being sober. She said, at least I'm happy when I'm drunk. Now, that's someone I loved, uh, still love. She passed on now. Alcohol killed her. Um, but <clears throat> we grew up together as children. And, um, and to see that state of mind saying that she could not be happy when she was sober um, is a, a terrible, terrible uh, indictment upon society. And um, so my, my fight for human rights and Aboriginal rights and sovereignty, etc., cetera, um, continues because we have to stop. This is our country. They are foreigners. Yeah, they've supplanted this country with all sorts of things. And, it, and they're evil. The things are evil, and we have to make a move. And I and I, I think we need to become much more positive. I, I think, um, and with all due respects to those people who are working in cities and towns and medical services and counselling services, I look, I, I admire you guys because you also have to have enormous uh, fortitude, uh, fortitudinal desires to really stay focused in those spaces because you know you're dealing with trauma that must impact on you personally, and um, you know and it and it's hard, it's very hard, and I appreciate you know, look I I I've met a lot of people and you know they. How they deal with that, I don't know. I know psychologists, white psychologists, who have to take a holiday all the time because you know they're dealing with all these traumas that, that, that exist. And so, you know, if you if you see a non-Aboriginal person who's a psychologist or a psychiatrist, sort of saying it's time for me to take my family and go and have a holiday, um, I need to break from this horrible world that um, I'm confronted with <coughs> and people's experience. I take my hat off to those Aboriginal councillors who uh, are working in this space because you have to deal with something that, um, yeah, the the society that we live in the and the circumstances of our lives and our, our surroundings belong to someone else and it's out of our control. But I think what we need to do is to turn that around and, and uh, gain some control. And um, I might add that, um, you know, the treaty... <laughs> If I can just make reference to that, um, I, I was the head of the Malcolm Fraser and uh, the NAC uh, National Aboriginal Conference. Uh, I was the director for um, developing a national framework for a treaty from 1981 to 1985. Uh, and then after that, Bob Hawke came into existence and Bob Hawke promised everything and then shut down the treaty process. And they did it and they shut it down very deliberately. And so I merely say to those who are working in the treaty area, be very careful for w of what you wish for. Um, I've seen it. I've seen it at the top level, as high as the Prime Minister's office and right into back to Buckingham Palace. The fact is, if you're developing a treaty, states can't develop treaties because they're limited by their constitution. They cannot give you what you want. They can give you all those little social... Um, and economic um, factors that you may desire uh, to fit into this world. Um, but politically and legally, um, you belong to them. And um, that's what's in that um, in the uh, uh, legislation in Victoria. It says they're negotiating with Victorian Aborigines. They're not dealing with um, Aboriginal um, Australians. They're dealing with Victorian Aborigines. So you have a deficit right at the beginning there in the legislation. Um, uh, I, I despair when I see that because I'm watching them cheat us <coughs> big time. And, of course, our people are so desirous of the need, you know, to have some economic development, some development of um, self-determination in some form. But you always have to remember this, yeah? This is our country, and don't shout out sovereignty never ceded if you don't bloody understand it, yeah, because... It, if you say sovereignty never ceded and then you go and talk with a state government, whether it be Northern Territory, South Australia, New South Wales or anywhere else, the fact is Australia does not have its own sovereignty. They operate under the sovereignty of England. And it's important for you to understand that in a treaty process someone has to give something. 
and in this case, what are you being asked to give up, and what is the Crown prepared to give up in terms of their claim, their illegal claim to this country? Until you find out what the Crown is prepared to give us, in exchange for what we give up, then you don't have a fair set of negotiations, and um, I think that's that's vital to understand that. And I say that. Um, only to warn people to say that you don't want to be in a situation where your name is down as a person who part of, partook in that and unfortunately you cut off the future for your grandchildren's grandchildren and their ability to be able to negotiate a settlement down the line somewhere else. This is it. You've got one go here um, and if you um, make a mistake <coughs> of the kind that I'm describing... Um, then you are cutting off the future um, heritage and inheritance of your grandchildren's grandchildren. And I don't think anybody should be responsible for that because when we, under Aboriginal law and culture, and, um, um, and I'm talking about LAW as well as LORE, LORE just comes from a, a the, describes a word of something where you get used to being practising and that's, uh, that's a, you, it's a customary practice. I might add that uh, that's where common law in England comes from because it's a customary practice of everybody that um, that they continue to observe and then they make that into a legislation to observe those rules. Other than that, you have social um, gatherings and social ways of doing things, and that's LORE, um, but ours also is celestial law, and those celestial laws of ours are our carvings, our stories, our turungas, uh, that's why they took them away from us, because that's our statute, that's our, what they call um, ritual statutes. And ritual statutes come from the creation. And uh, ritual statutes in Australian law, a court after Mabo, no court in this country can tell us that's not right, And uh, because the, the courts are banned from it. So there's a lot of education that our people need to, to have. Um, we need to address changing the... the um, the discourse, and um, I think we have a, an enormous task ahead of us, but we have a responsibility not to shirk um, that responsibility. And, um, and yeah, I think we need to address this. And, and my final comment is, um, it is a terrible state of affairs when we listen to our young ones say that if you haven't been to jail, you're no longer, you're not a real Aborigine because you haven't been initiated. That's not the way it's done, yeah? And um, we need, and to go into prison and say you're finding your, your um, ceremony and your dance and your culture in a, in a, in a uh, prison, um, um, what can I say? Um, yeah, we have, we have uh, ceremonial abilities to be able to bring our young ones back into ceremony and dance, but we need country. We need our country, we need our sacred places. We need to fight for those sacred places and stop these com companies, mining companies, and these uh, irrigators and land clearers from destroying that which is left. We know where they are, we can tell the stories where they are, we need to stop it. And um, I think we'd be able to address some of this stuff because the kids are doing what they do now because there is nothing else for them. That's what they see. So. Thank you for listening, and um, I hope I haven't gone too far over my time. Thank you so, so much, Ank. I mean, we could all probably listen to to you all day and such, such important insights from your lived experience. I mean, from, from being working in the court systems and in the tent embassy and all of your life's work to hear you sort of shine some really important truths on the treaty process. I think you're, you're absolutely right. There's no silver bullet for this stuff. And we have to make sure that whatever Victoria is about to walk into is, um, is protected for, for the future generations. So I think, thank you for those insights. Um, one thing around the, 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 the notion of healing country and the important role that um, country has when we talk about culture. Um, I think this year our NAIDOC theme is Heal Country and it really talks about how we can, um, how do we live happy and healthy lives without, um, without access to our resources, as you say. 
I'm going to open up for some questions uh, just while while I'm seeing some commentary come through. Uh, we've got a couple of minutes and we can take a couple of questions before we kind of move into our next speaker. Just seeing some comments come through, Ank, about, um, about the inspirational, insightful conversation you've had. Um, thanking you for these tough conversations and how uh, they do impact on us emotionally and spiritually. Um, lots of really positive comments to to your yarn today, so thank you. Yeah, thank you. I just ask, oh, sorry, go on. No, I was just saying thank you. No, thank you. It's such a it's such an honour to hear your wisdom and um, to learn from people who have been involved in this this for your whole life. Um, I've got a question while we're waiting, and um, I guess I'm keen to understand and pick up this notion of what you're saying, Unc, about that strong leadership that's really needed. Um, we talked about yesterday uh, some terms around self-determination and rhetoric and, and for many mainstream institutions what that looks like. You've been involved in this space for so long. I'm keen to understand what does um, what does strong leadership and self-determination look like for, from your perspective? Ownership um, is the word, ownership. We need to take ownership of everything that uh, that is... Um, um, as they say, Aboriginal in this country. But um, I'm a Uwalio man. I'm training and teaching my people that um, we are Uwalio. We are not not a British subject. We're not a citizen of this country. And um, we need to understand that. And um, I'm now sort of uh, having, you know, done all the work that I've done and the research and um, I've travelled the world quite regularly looking at different experiences around the world and um, one of the things that I have now come to, I, 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 we do have a silver bullet. Our people don't realise that we have the silver bullet. And that silver bullet, bullet is us and our law and culture. And um, if you look very carefully at recent High Court decisions in this, in this uh, Aboriginal affairs space, um, you read between the lines, the answers have been given to us. And we need just simply to assert um, the uh, political correctness that has to be observed in relation to us as first possessors of this country. You see, and I, I keep telling people now, um, the courts cannot go against the decisions of the elders of a nation. And, um, and even when we take back land, we just go and occupy land. The question then is, how do they get us off that land? How do, what, what, what's their move? Yes, they can send in the military. Yes, they can send in the police. But then as soon as they do that, it becomes a legal matter. And then the question arises then. You get it into the courtroom system, and I tell you this right now. They no longer want to fight these things out in the court because they are losing. They are losing everywhere. And um, we have to become smart. And I'm, I'm always talking to people and saying... You know, we need to bring our youth, our young people together in a national conference just to talk on this issue. And um, But everybody's saying, oh, we got no TA, we've got to go and ask the government for money. Duh, you don't ask your colonising occupier to give you money to go and talk about independence and, um, and our statehood. No, um, we have to do that ourselves. And it's the, it's the willingness of our young people to be able to want to do that. And, um, you know, and, and like my, I have a son who's 33, um, uh, 34, sorry, shit, I don't know the age of my own son. But anyway, he's completing a PhD on the, on the, in the area of identity. And, um, and he's, uh, he finishes it this year. And um, he, he, I look at him and I say, do you know who you are now? <laughs> and um, and I, and I, and he says, "Dad, it's just not me. It's everyone else that's around us." And so, and, and because that whole thing has been lost, yeah, and we have to bring it back. And um, yeah, the, we we have a. Uh, I think you know the the Black Power movement and the embassy and the political struggles of the nineteen thirties, forties with you know, um, the late Margaret Tucker and others from the Yorta Yorta who walked across 
you know, they uh, swam across and rowed across the river at um, Kumaragunja uh, to escape the, the evils of the New South Wales government administration um, against Aboriginal people. Um, but we're going to take lessons from those people. You know, they actually moved their whole lives and, and just moved. We have to take lessons from, you know, the Gurindji who just simply said, enough is enough, we're going out, we're taking back our country, and they just walked off that and walked, you know, however far it was, down to Dagaragu, to their own traditional land, and squatted there and said, we're not moving, done. And so, you know, that's, like, these are people who um, had no money, um, these people just had themselves and their belief in who they were. They're, they held that very strongly. They knew where they, what they wanted as a people. And unfortunately, um, if I can just say this, the, the last assault, I call this the assault, the last major assault against Aboriginal people was the 1970s um, um, policy and strategic plan to educate Aborigines and get them to, into employment when they set up what they call the family resettlement programs throughout this country. And those family resettlement programs relocated Aboriginal people off their communal, um, uh, out of communal areas where there was strength in unity, where there was strength because they were all family. And they moved them to places from Walgett and Burke and Brewarren, or like in New South Wales, for example. Uh, they moved them to Orange, to Dubbo, to Bathurst, to Wad uh, Wagga Wagga and to Newcastle. And of course they got them into there. But here's the problem. The moment the 70s, then, then came the late 70s and you had that little mini depression that, that happened. Um, um, and then that, that economic depression, the first people who were put off work were blackfellas. Yeah, they lost the job. Then they all went on the dole. And then, you know, and then you had this mass migrational pattern of people going home for security, back to Walgut, back to Brewarrina. And, you know, that... Um, and then all of a sudden you see a lot of domestic violence starting to arise in those, in those areas, in, you know, around Wagga, around Bathurst and all those places. And because, you know, the men needed their space, the women needed their space, and then all of a sudden they, they got lost in translation and they missed each other. And, and that had devastating effects, that uh, family resettlement program. Um, and I'd love for one day for someone to really study that and have a look at it and have a look at the impacts that that had on our people. Um, yeah, I could go on all day. But anyway, thank you. Thank you. Um, we could listen to you all day. I just want to say thank you so much for that. I think the, the key take home for me, and you know, uh, as you say, reflecting on Kamra Gunja and my, my family part of that movement, is that it is about community ownership. You know, that's what self determination. It's not just setting up some advisory committees, but how do we reclaim or get access to the resources? And that's where we're going to get power and be heard. So. And it sounds to me that um, there's a lot of work that we also need to do as mob as well about how we present the ideas back and, and be um, united in our front. So I just want to thank you so much. I would love to talk to you all day, as I'm sure many of the guests here would. And just thank you for not only being here today, but everything that you have done in your life to support um, the mob and especially your, your local community. So thank you so much, Uncle. You're welcome and thanks for the opportunity. Take care. Yeah.